Hello and welcome. My name is Hugo Curry and I'm a Year 12 high school student at the Riverina Anglican College in Wagga Wagga, Australia. This is a series of brief interviews with some of the most amazing physicists from around the world. I'm passionate about physics and will pursue a career in physics and engineering. So I'm honored to be able to ask a few questions of some inspirational physicists. I really wanna thank them all for generously taking the time to chat and importantly, passing on their rich insights. Hopefully other students with an aptitude for physics can take inspiration and guidance from their experiences and insights to shape the next generation of physicists. Today I'm speaking to Professor Stuart Bouchon. Professor Bouchon has been a professor and section chief of radiologic physics at Bayer College of Medicine in Houston, Texas since 1976. Professor Bouchon has been integral in the professional associations and licensure boards for medical physicists in Texas and the USA and holds medical physics license number 0001. He has numerous textbooks in MRI, CT, ultrasound and radiation protection, but his radiologic science textbook is in its 12th edition and used globally as a textbook for university students since 1974. Professor Bouchon is a legend in radiological physics. Thank you for taking the time to share with us your thoughts and insights today. Hugo, thank you for the introduction. And it's a total pleasure for me to be with you and to have some time with you, yes. Thank you. So first off, um, I'm interested to know what drew you to a career in physics um, and yeah, what excites you about physics, I guess? Uh, actually, who knows the answer to that? You know, you, when I was in high school, um, I was a pretty good student, and um, but not outstanding. And I was interested in science and who knows why or what. But I got to tell you, my senior year in high school, I had taken all of the science and math that was available. And I had a physics teacher who taught physics to seniors in high school. And I had finished physics as a junior. So there wasn't any more science for me to take. And it turns out, and I, I totally admire this guy and have thanked him many times over. Edmund Burke was his name. He was my physics teacher. And there were several others in my class uh, who were also, he started what he called an advanced science course for six of us. There were just six in the class. And we spent our senior year with Edmund Burke. And that's what really pushed me on to physics at the university level. One of my, one of my fellow students in that class was a guy named Alan Haught. And that year, when we graduated from high school, Alan Haught was the, and I've forgotten exactly what the title was, but it was the Westinghouse Science Talent Search number one. He was the number one high school student in this Westinghouse Science Search or whatever. Well, anyway, I, I'm disappointed that I've lost track of Alan Hart. I don't know where he went or what he did or anything. I've tried to find out, but I know he went up in New England somewhere and that was the end of it. Anyway, so why to get into physics? Uh, Edmund Burke, that's why. And I, I will forever hold him responsible. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, having good teachers and mentors is very, very important. Um, because I mean, uh, if a teacher is, you know, doesn't um, excite students about physics, they're not going to ever, you know, get into a career in physics or any science, really. Yes, yes. Um, so what do you see on the horizon of physics uh, that would inspire the next generation of physicists? When I, when I talk about physics, wait a minute, I want to show you something like this. If we're talking about physics, I got to look like a physicist, all right? <laughs> so the next generation of physicists, there is so much on the horizon right now that is absolutely spectacular. And I'm having more fun personally, just trying to keep up with what physicists are doing today. And I think what I would have those who are students like yourself right now, getting ready to go to university, stay in touch with, we know, artificial intelligence right now, all right? And there's just a ton of uh, work coming out in artificial intelligence. 
But I think what's going to rule beyond that is something called quantum computing, where instead of considering the um, dipole state of an electron up or down, so as clockwise or counterclockwise, we're now considering physicists are now considering the metastable states of electrons and have already put this together into a showboat kind of computer called a quantum computer. And I bet you, I don't know for sure, but I bet you within, within five years, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll scrap all of our digital computers and we will buy quantum computers. So that, that's where we're going, yeah. Yeah, cool, yeah. I, we uh, definitely have heard a, a little bit about quantum computers um, down here. I think I want a couple of our universities have got a pretty good quantum program developing quantum computers in down here in Australia. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, no, it's common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hang with it. Yeah. yeah, you could you could be the quantum computing guru. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. I'm interested to know what skills you've relied on most throughout your career um, as a physicist. Um, I would say communication skills. Wait a minute. I would say communication skills, for instance, magnetic resonance imaging, the physics of MRI as a medical physicist in imaging and that sort of thing is really difficult to explain. Now, let me, let me give you another example. Um, I never talk about, I never talk, oops, I got this on backwards. Look at that. You see that? You see what that is? That's hard to do on the you see, what, what is that? Hugo, what I'm is that on my head? A penguin. A penguin. Do you know the penguin tail? I don't think I do, no. Uh, you're going to learn it. Because the penguin tail is an exceptional way to communicate the physics of magnetic resonance imaging. Penguin tail goes like this. In the Antarctic, there is a beautiful iceberg that is so glorious that it attracts penguins from far and near. And these penguins climb up on the iceberg until the iceberg is saturated with penguins. The next penguin to climb up on the iceberg pushes a penguin off. The, 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 the iceberg cannot hold any more penguins because it's saturated and one on, one off establishes the state of equilibrium. Saturation, equilibrium. Um, <clears throat> that's the physics of the penguin tail. When I'm lecturing about MRI or about anything, I will always start with the penguin tail and I'll point out that uh, my lecture today is an extension of the penguin tail because most of what you're going to hear from me for the next 60 minutes is baloney. But when I say on a slide that this slide is a penguin, that means there's information on this slide that you've got to stick on your iceberg, which is your mind. And you do this without any consideration for what penguin is being pushed off. You got that? The penguin tail. If you, if you're not nothing else. The penguin tail is a great way to pass on physics to unknowing audiences. <laughs> <laughs> so, you've had um, such an amazing career. I'm interested to know um, what you think is what you um, consider the highlight of your career to be. Oh, I, that's another I exceptional question, and I would say that, that there are many. Let me give you the earliest. I mean, because when I finished high school, I went to the University of Maryland. Here, in, here in, uh, in the United States, if you hold your hand up like this, this is the hand, the hand signal, the hand sign of a Baylor bear, the bears of Baylor University. If you roll your hand over and, and, you, and you hold it like this, 
This is the hand sign of my university, which was the University of Maryland. And that university's mascot is a turtle, <laughs> the Maryland Terrapins. So I graduated from University of Maryland with a degree in nuclear physics. And I ended up in Idaho at the national, at the time it was called the National Reactor Testing Station. And I'm working on a paper right now. And the title of the paper is Anyone Else? And the question is, and I think the answer is no. Is there another medical physicist out there? Because you'll see this in, in, in medical physics. Is there, and I get it, but is there another medical physicist out there who has participated and helped to melt down two nuclear reactors? Because that's what got me started. I went out to Idaho in nuclear physics, actually in health physics, and I'm working out there and we melted down the SL1, stationary, low power, three guys died in that reactor accident. And I was, at, at that night, I got a call from my boss at two o'clock in the morning. And he said, Stuart said, their arms are going off at the SL1, get the pool car. And go. So a guy named Stan Herzinger and I got in the car and went out there and I was the first one in the SL1, climbing around and up onto the operating floor and saw one guy was impaled into the ceiling because he'd been screwing around with a control rod. Anyway, three guys died in that. So, so I quit that job and took a job with Westinghouse in Pittsburgh and went to work at the Westinghouse testing reactor. Ah, and guess what happened? We melted that down. <laughs> and that's when I discovered medical physics and that's how I got into medical physics. So that's, that's what's important. That, that, was, that was a very important uh, period for me medical physics, that's what got me into medical physics. I obviously didn't have any skill set for nuclear physics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, talking about your work in nuclear reactors, um, I'm interested to know what that was like and um, any, do you have any insights from those experiences from um, your early years? Uh, the, the one thing that I do remember from the early years, and it was from, and it's something that I, that I practice daily today, because I learned this from a guy named John Burdine, and I'm sitting in Burdine's office, and we're talking about something, I've forgotten why I was there, he was my boss at the time. And we're sitting there and, and, and I, I don't even remember what the discussion was about, but he interrupted me because I said to him, hey, we can take this up tomorrow or the next day or do it later. And he said, no, 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 we got to get to the answer now. And he called two other people into his office and whatever it was, we did it right then and there. And I have used that approach to so many situations since then. And that is, I try really hard not to put something off. If, if, if I have a, a situation that requires attention, and the attention can be now or later or next month or now, I do it now if I can, just because if I don't, I'll forget. And I, and I forget more and more. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. That's a good question. And I'm very appreciative to Bernheim for that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, is, is there anything uh, in physics that's important or contentious that you would like to see the next generation of physicists work on? I guess we were talking about um, AI and quantum computing before. Um, I guess, does that kind of fit that model? Um, it, that, yes, that of course does fit the model. But what really is neat about medical physics is that I am embroiled right now in a controversy and I am on the um, minority side of, of the argument. And it has to do with, I mean, this is very mundane, but it has to do with specific area shielding. Gonad shields, for instance, in projection radiography, in radiography, fluoroscopy, see whatever. And 
just two years ago, and I didn't even know this was on the pike, but, but a paper was published that basically said we got to abandon gonad shields because the technologists don't know how to apply them and they don't collimate properly and it drives up the ABS system. And anyway, and I saw this and I immediately said, oh, this doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I have written one contra article that has stimulated several other articles by other uh, medical physicists who disagree with me, who say, hey, now nah, we agree, um, uh, uh, we agree with the position that it's time to abandon specific area shielding. And, and the reasons that they give is that, because we can't teach how to do it correctly at any rate. I don't agree, and I'm working. I'm working on another paper on this right now. So that's a, that's what's really good about medical physics, because you're dealing with patients, and patient situations. New stuff comes up all the time. Tomosynthesis, brand new. I mean, I brand new within the last five years, and it's going to take over. I think tomosynthesis will take over for radiography, for mammography already. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's good stuff. It's all good stuff. Yeah, cool. Well, so um, I've got one one final question. Um, do you have any final uh, pearls or pitfalls to offer high school students that have an aptitude for physics? I don't know that it's a peril or a pitfall. Those are good words, though. They're, and and there's, those are good words to... But I would say... <clears throat> that when I was in high school and even today that I have grand aves, grandchildren in high school and, 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 and they're all, uh, the students today, you, Hugo, are super smart. I considered when I was in school physics, and maybe chemical engineering to be the most difficult subjects. And so my advice to talented students who have um, the aptitude for science or engineering to step up in whatever it is that you think you might like to do because you can always take a step back as you progress through your education. But as you progress, you cannot start off in business. And as a junior in university, go into science or engineering. On the other hand, some of the most successful um, salespeople that I have dealt with through the years who have sold x-ray equipment, I mean, working for GE and Siemens and, and, and Toshiba, those, and, I, and I could, I think of three or four guys who started off and graduated as either an engineer, or I'm thinking of one in particular that graduated as a lawyer. And, and, and they never ended up doing what they were going to do. Whatever, however you graduate, whatever job you take to start your career, in all likelihood is not gonna be what you'll be doing 10 years from, from when you graduate. So my, my, my stand is um, take the most difficult courses you can and stay with them as long as you can because there'll be nothing but help for you in the future and, and help you to succeed in the future. So for instance, Hugo, for yourself, if you have any interest in physics, which you do, I, I would say, Go into physics. Don't don't screw around with engineering or biology or chemistry. Go into physics. And if and two or three years down the road you don't like physics, you you can take all of that that you've done and switch into engineering. There are a ton of good jobs in the U.S. in engineering, for instance. We don't have yeah. enough engineers. Anyway, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you um so much for uh, such a rich insight into the world of medical physics. Uh, in physics in general. I really appreciate you taking the time to inspire the next generation of physicists. And I'm sure that those that listen will share my appreciation. Thanks. Thanks for. Good.
Good show, Hugo. Good show. And thanks for keeping it a short interview. That's great. Well oh, done. Good. Thank oh, you. Good. Thanks good for keeping to us entertained with the, uh, with the hats. <laughs> See you now. Bye.